And how many of you, how many of you found the five P's? Five P's of faith. We, we, we've got one person. You found four? Well, I gave you one, though. You gave two. That's, that's true. I gave us pilgrimage, yeah. Uh, real quick, Elsie, what do you have? Well, I have a promise. A promise, definitely. Things promised. I have what? The Passover and the swelling of the blood. Ooh. Persevere. Persevere, definitely. Well, that's four. That's four. <laughs> okay, okay. What about the rest of you? Okay. Did, did we forget? Yes. Did we not do it? Yes. <laughs> this is a concern. Uh, I don't know what the teachers did uh, when you forget the homework, but you know what my teachers did? We go forward, and your grade is just not where it should be. <laughs> so, but I, I would like to give our ladies the Bass Clan. You ready? Would you like to share yours? I have the one who gave Silver Clan has the stated promise, place, and prepare. Very good. What, what do you mean for place? The promised land, yeah, it's, it's a place that he will go to. Very good. And the last one you have is? Prepare. Yes, very good. Right on. So I said I would have uh, a gift for those who did their homeworks. Their homeworks? Homework. So enjoy Dutch Brothers here on Miami. Mean, thank you for doing it. Hey, we got a, I don't know about your teachers, but uh, they reward the ones that like do something, right? <laughs> Nancy has the ultimate. I've got K cups for her. Yeah, and there's a big, a big amount. So yeah, and full disclosure, we're gonna now steal from Nancy. Okay. <laughs> and then Laura says, so the pastor's stealing. That came out wrong. <laughs> so Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. You guys will see. Uh, yeah. You guys will see uh, the the five Ps that that I came up with. They're certainly not etched in in stone. But uh, they should be fairly accurate and close to what everybody uh, had for their homework. Um, so Hebrews 11, verse 8. And before we, before we delve into that, has anyone ever seen the show Shark Tank? Man, that's like too much, right? I tell you, it's, a, it's an interesting show. I had never heard of it. And so Tanya and I were, were in Hawaii, and I... I collapsed on a two-mile hike, and I'm, I'm not lying. I don't remember anything. I just remember waking up and talking to Gatorade. <laughs> and so I'm like, where are we? Well, we're in the hotel because you collapsed. So it was like 95 and 100% humidity. So I just like, you know, electrolyte issue, bam, I collapsed. Anyways, so I'm sick. I'm laid up, and like, like within a day, Tanya's sick. So what are we going to do? Well, we'll watch some TV, and there was this show called Shark Tank. I'm like, I've never heard of this, but I know Mark Cuban because he's a Dallas Mavericks owner and he hates the Kings. So I know him. And so we're, our teams are like rivals. And so, all right, we'll watch this. And as you guys know, they have a product. They're going to try to persuade them to, to buy in, right? I'll give you, for $100,000, I'll get 10% of the company or whatever happens. Now, as you're presenting, you obviously need to know your stuff, your market. But, you know, I've noticed... Ruth, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but there'll be a couple of guys that go even above and beyond. They hire someone to come in and promote their product. So I wanna, as we look at Hebrews 11, I'm not saying the author is going to try to promote Christianity, but the author is going to give us an example that every Jew would know, and that is going to enhance his message. Does that make sense? Okay, so imagine I've got this lesson on Hebrews, Hebrews 11, but instead of me doing it, Tim Tebow comes up here. And I mean, let's just be honest. The guy's ripped. Hey, how you guys doing? Let's look at some Hebrews today. All of a sudden, everybody's like, woo! Even my wife's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, whoa! It's going to mean a little bit, like it'll it'll maybe enhance what God's principles, principles are. So let's look at verse 8 through 16 of Hebrews chapter 11. The author says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of a promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents in Isaac and Jacob, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, 
whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. Truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for these really powerful eight, nine verses, Lord. We just look forward to seeing how many different ways you impact faith and in, in, in different dynamics. Lord, we just pray for our hearts as we go through this, that we're convicted, that we know for sure whether we're living a life of faith. And Father, again, I pray I'm removed and that all this here is your word speaking to your people and that it, it changes us. Lord, that our hearts are broken before you and that we want to, to ultimately, Lord, surrender everything to a life of faith in you. And so, Lord, we just give you glory during this time now. Amen. As you guys can see right there, don't, don't move in time. Faith means what? It means to trust in God's promises, his character. That's what it literally means in the Greek. We, we need to remember that because the whole passage that we're in, this Hall of Fame portion, these are the greats. This is what it means. I'm trusting God's character and promises. It's not some mystical, I get to create something. It's I'm trusting his character. To make sure we're all on the same page, I put it up there again so we make sure that we know what the author is saying. And obviously, as we go through, we saw that the author was writing to Jewish believers. And we've seen all the ways in which Jesus is superior, haven't we? Jesus is superior in all these ways, so you can't go back. And finally, the author begins chapter 11 saying, man, faith, trusting God and his promises, his character. This is what is going to be the substance of things that are hoped for. This is what it's all about, guys. It's about faith. And that's Old Testament and New Testament. You're saved by faith and God's promises and his character, which are seen and completely embodied in his son, Christ Jesus. That's how you're saved. Are we clear? It cannot be any more clear. It's throughout Old Testament and New. And we saw that not only is Jesus superior, not only do we have a new covenant, but faith is so important that highlight a worthy verse, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. If you do not live a life that's trusting his character and his promises, it's impotent. Remember, you can't do it. it there's no way to be close to God. There's no way to please God. You cannot do it because why? Because he's a rewarder of those who what? Who diligently seek him. That means they're all in. Like, I gotta, I gotta know more about God and his character. I've gotta be all in. And so knowing that, knowing how crucial faith is, guys, everything hinges on this, doesn't it? Amen. Like your salvation, your walk with God, whether you're just gonna drift in life, everything literally hinges on faith. And so the author begins once again. If we're gonna talk about faith, Let's go to the one example every Jew would admit is awesome. And that's who? Abraham. So if I'm going to sell something, not that we're selling it, but if I want a good, good example, we would go and find the best possible. And for a Jew, the father of many nations, that is Abraham. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Let's go ahead and you can see in our notes and on the screen there. Make sure you have your notes. So right here, we start with the first P and that is a pilgrimage. Guys, if you're going to come to Christ and you're going to place your faith in God's son, Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again on the third day, that's going to set you out on a pilgrimage, isn't it? It's going to send you places that you didn't know you would be. Ultimately, it's a pilgrimage away from sin, isn't it? 
It's a way out of the old way of life into a new heavenly spiritual blessings. That's unheard of for those who are not saved. So you're on a pilgrimage and you see that by faith, Abraham trusting in God and his promises, he obeyed. Guys, he listened attentively. And notice what it says on the screen. It says, the Greek word, guys, it's the duty of a porter. What's a porter? Does anybody know what a porter is? Somebody who carries your baggage. Guys, it's the ultimate. It's, it's kind of a twist on the janitor, isn't it? Like they are, are, are supposed to clean. They're supposed to get your bags. They instantly are supposed to submit and do what someone else wants, aren't they? And so we see that Abraham, he heard God. Boom. He instantly submitted and says, I heard God. I'm in. Because that's a life of faith. Just for you John Wayne fans out there. Bill, north to Alaska talks and has a character that is a porter in it. So there you go. That's a free win today. <laughs> so we have Abraham. He is just going to submit instantly when he hears God. And you see he was called out. Guys, he literally heard God. We have countless examples in scripture in which uh, Abraham is literally in the presence of either God or an angel or one of his messengers. In fact, many scholars think the pre-incarnate Christ is, some, is one of the angels that Abraham in fact, because of his faith, gets to me. But we see that he hears it and he instantly submits. And then we see that he goes out. So he leaves this, he leaves this place and he doesn't know where he's going. Guys, he does not have a fixed attention at, I'm, this is where I'm going to move. Elsie's going to move to Colorado. That's your fixed attention. I'm going at some point to Colorado. Abraham did not have that, guys. I heard God. I submitted. It doesn't make any sense. But I heard him, and I'm going to obey. This is so important because, guys, so many times in America, we have a five-year plan, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, i got to have a five-year plan. i got to have a ten-year plan. Oh, man, what am I going to do with my money? What am I going to do? i got to have it working for me. Abraham didn't have that, did he? As we look throughout these characters, they hear God. Moses hears God. But a lot of times they didn't know where they were going. Sometimes they do. Other times they don't. But we see that when we hear God... We are to act. This leads to one of my all-time favorite devotions. Dave, this one's for you. January 13th, Mr. Blackaby. When God speaks, nothing stays the same. Because when God speaks, the, the universe is created. When God speaks, you were created. God speaks. He has every intention and power to see that his will, his will is brought to fruition. Well, amen to that. How many times did it take Jesus to say, Lazarus, come forth? Just once. Because when God speaks, nothing stays the same. Glad right Baptist church. Nothing changes. Nothing so if you hear God, if you hear God, then something in your life has to change. You cannot continue to go on. Oh, I heard God. No, you didn't. Because when he speaks, things change. Things happen. Because <coughs> he's God. He has almighty, almighty power. Again, we're on a pilgrimage. And... When you come to Christ and you say, I want to live a life of faith, we don't know where that will go. And, and this is not to, to brag in, in any way. But I, I remember at age 19, I said, Lord, I know I've been saved for, for many years, but I've never said, Lord, I'm willing to go. I've never like Abraham. I heard you and I'm, I'm in. And so I remember standing up in camp saying, Lord, I'm willing to go wherever you had. Do you think I honestly, after getting my degrees in college and everything, would come from a huge capital city and the fifth largest economy in the world to a population of 900. <laughs> Probably not, because you're on a pilgrimage. You're like, I would have no foresight to go, yes, clearly, my path is glide working. Like, that just doesn't make any sense, does it? It does if you're living a life of faith and you say, Lord, I'm willing to submit. I'm willing to obey what you have. I remember, Bill, you got your gun, got your truck, and you got your wife. Right? Now you're official applied person. Yeah. They don't have that in the California, in the city. But when you're on a pilgrimage, you don't know where you're going to end up. Verse 9. He didn't know where he was going, but by faith, what? He dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country. He was dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The second one that I had for those, those P's, as you can see on the screen, it's patience. Now, guys, for those of you who are going to follow God and live a life of faith, that means I'm going to trust his promises. I'm trusting his character. The word patience, guys, means it's a, it's a life of endurance. 
We're going to get, we're going to see it in chapter 12 explicitly that the word patience means hupomone. It means to bear and to endure, to continue on. People that are living a life of saving faith, they will continue to follow God no matter what, won't they? It will continue, in fact, to grow. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. One of the fruits of the Spirit and growing in God and trusting His, His promises, His character is a byproduct. Is the fruits of the Spirit is the idea of endurance. I'm going to keep following even when I don't understand it. Even when I don't know where I'm going. I heard God and I trust that. And so we see in verse 9 and 10 that that uh, I, Abraham, he dwelt in the land. Guys, he settled there. He settled in a land that really wasn't for him ultimately, was it? We see that it's a land of promise, but he's living there as if what? As if he's a foreign country. Guys, he's an alien. He doesn't belong there. He does not have a, an America. He doesn't have a glide like, this is my home, this is my roots. He doesn't have that. In fact, we see that not only does he not have a settled down location, but notice verse 9. What does he dwell in? He dwells in tents. You'll notice I put that in, in caps. This is so important, guys. But when you think of tents, what do you guys think of? Camping, Camping right? Is that what you guys think of? I do. But I also think, man, tents, they are not really secure, are they? No. Oh, well, I hammered some stuff down, some stakes in the ground. Can't Come on, man. A good windstorm, you're gone. <laughs> right? There's no, like, real settled down. There's no roots. It's like symbolic of a nomad, isn't it? They're just going to nomadically wander around. There's no, this is what I'm going to lay down my house and my foundation. Many of you have RVs, though. Those are pretty sweet, aren't they? Because you can, you know, portable, you can take them everywhere. You're like, this is, this is pretty good, right? You get your full hookup. As I've said several times, it seems like just a moving hotel. Right? You still got your cable and heaters and all of that stuff. But I tell you, the tents, I remember Tanya and I, we, we got married, we went to Hawaii, we came back, and it wasn't even a month later, and we went on the church camp out at Diamond Lake. We were so excited because we got, since we both had a house and everything, we decided to put camping things on our registry. And you guys brought a whole bunch of stuff, and so, hey, this is going to be great. We're going to go to Diamond Lake. We're going to put up our tent. And I'm telling you, I put up our tent. And within 30 minutes, Pastor Mike, Dave, uh, Dave and Marty, they came over, and they met, and many more came over. Hey, they saw our tent. Are you sure you want to stay in that? Oh, yeah, we'll be fine. Because you guys know something about tents and, and elevation. It gets really cold in tents. They're, 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 really, they're really lean, aren't they? A little bit of fabric here, and I'll tell you. At 2 a.m., I realized why you guys were so concerned. Because a bear trap all of a sudden just got both shoulders. It was my wife's fingernails. And she was so cold. I'm telling you, I probably have a scar somewhere here. Bill, that's why you need shoulder surgery. At one point, Janet probably got cold. And, she, I, and I remember, guys, looking over at 2 a.m., and she's like freezing. She's got every blanket on, and she is like this to me. She's like, I didn't sleep a wink. Yeah, neither did I. <laughs> And, but you guys get it. Like tents are really thin. There's no settling down. They're a symbol for the, that nomad, and we want to find something else. And we see that by faith, Abraham was doing that on purpose, guys, because he was trusting that God would lead him somewhere else. As you guys can see on the screen, verse 10, he was ultimately waiting. What's he waiting for? For a city. Verse 10, a city that has a foundation. Who's builder and maker's God? You guys can see that he's waiting for a great city. And you notice the great, it's an institution of truth. That means only God himself could create this. And ultimately, he's, of course, looking for a heavenly promised land, isn't he? And he's doing so by faith. And we see that the builder, the maker is God. Obviously, it's a craftsman. And you see it's a workman for the public. That's Jesus Christ who comes down. He's the author, the perfecter of our faith. He's our captain. If we turn to chapter 3 we'll see that Moses, even though he is faithful, who's the one that builds the house? The builder and maker is God, and his servant is Christ Jesus. That's chapter 3. We also see, and are going to see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, that'll be in probably a month, we'll see that we have a city of the living God, and that's what those guys were looking for. We see that this idea of building and waiting for that heavenly dwelling place. It's throughout the book of Hebrews. 
Five Baptist Church, that means it should be our mindset. We should be looking to heaven, shouldn't we? We should be realizing that we are temporary. We're just sojourners as we go through this life here on earth. This isn't our long-term place for those who know Christ Jesus as Savior. Frankly, my parents are in their 70s now. My grand, Both grandparents made it to 90. If I'm lucky and maybe the running and stop soda, maybe I get to 91, right, Keith? But that's pretty, pretty, pretty minuscule when you think about spending the rest of eternity with God himself, isn't it? That's because my mindset, we need to focus not on here in the materialism of America, but focus on our heavenly dwelling place. That means you got to get and prepare yourself and get ready to meet God, which means to be studying and thirsting for his word. It means, yes, do your homework. <laughs> Let's invest in that because we're going to ultimately spend more time where? In the city which has a foundation and builder that is God. Amen to that, right? Amen. How about verse 13? Excuse me, verse 11. By faith, you'll see that the author transitions to the wife, Sarah. Sarah herself, she received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child. And when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised Guys, we see in verse 11 that very, very, very important. But we see the power of faith. If you look at the word strength in verse 11, that literally means to, to take hold of it. It's, it's the power from Almighty God. Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. We see that this power of faith can bring someone who's in their hundreds, triple digits, this power, this belief that God's promised his character, it will lead to the conception of a child. Why? Because God said it would happen. And Sarah did believe that. You can see that she lays hold of it. That gives her this power from God. And it's the founding. And why? Because she judged him faithful. She put her trust and she knew that when he spoke to her husband, this is going to happen. Now, if you think back to the actual, the actual encounter where Sarah is told she will have a kid, what does she actually do? She laughs. She laughs. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a contradiction in scripture. It says here she's Hall of Fame. She is so great because of her faith, but she laughed. Clearly she was doubting. No, she was not doubting. In fact, the author makes it very clear that she has an attitude that is very much humble and submissive. The laughter is very much in biblical proportions. Uh, she's not that she's not believing God, but I'm, I'm terming this, she has this wild idea of what God can do. For example, for example, if you had told me seven years ago that I'm going to get married, I'd say, cool, because I, I would love to be married. If you told me I'm going to be married to a spouse that wants to serve the Lord, I'd be, yes, because that's part of the thing I'm looking for. I want to serve in ministry with my future life. But if you told me that I would get those two and someone that is going to get me out of my bubble and go on mission trips like every year, what would I have done? I laugh. Oh, that's hilarious. Dude, is it because I'm doubting God? No, I'm just completely like, whoa, that'd be pretty wild, wouldn't it? So we see that right here, Sarah herself, it's not that she's doubting, she's like, oh, that'd be pretty wild, wouldn't it? That I would have a child at an age that is over 100. Not doubting God, just simply saying, wow, that would be amazing. And guys, the name Isaac, does anybody know what it means? Uh, Isaac himself means laughter. And guys, for a Jew, that is absolutely crucial because Jewish culture to this day, names are absolutely of the utmost importance. When you name your kid, it's for a significant event in your life or it's what you hope that your child will become or represent. It's still to this day very, very big in their culture. And so Sarah is not, that, uh, is not doubting in any way. In fact, she even names Isaac for this special moment, laughter. That's something that should be remembered, shouldn't it? That man, I never thought it would happen, but yet, wow, what a wild idea. And she, we see in verse 11, she judged him faithful who had promised. She knew that he was stable. He was God. I trust his character. And so I'm going to move forward in that. Verse 12, so in light of that faith, in light of Sarah, having faith in God's promise, verse 12, therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky, innumerable as the sand which is the seashore. We see the power of faith there, don't we? Guys, there's so many Jews now. It's like the sand on the seashore. And Abraham never got to see it. 
but they had a belief that it would happen. They knew, they trusted his character. And as you see in verse 12 there at the bottom there, good is dead. Therefore, in light of her faith, Abraham, even though he was uh, worn out, I love that. You guys see that on the screen? He's worn out. The guy's a hundred and some years old. Now, hey, good luck with having kids. I'm just speaking as two 36-year-olds. Man, it's tiring. I tell you, we get to nap time at one, it's like, oh my gosh, I swear I, got, I just went through a war zone, right? This is nothing compared to a marathon, right? It's just there, you just feel wore out. I can't imagine having a kid at, at past the age of 100, and yet because of their faith, because they trusted in God's promises, even though they were mortified and worn out, it still happened. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were assured of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Verse 13 is very, very big. As we can see on the screen, there's a lot of stuff. I'm sorry. I uh, just had to make it a little tiny, but this is a crucial verse, guys. We see that there, I had uh, the positive aspects of faith. And if, if you can see in verse 13, I want you to circle this. Okay? You see the phrase, these all. I want you to, to circle that because it's so important. A lot of scholars, they, they can misinterpret this. We have people that, that, that get this incorrectly. Verse 13 is only referring to who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These three, they died in faith, not having what? Received the promises, but having seen them afar off. For example, Isaac, Abraham sees his son born, does he not, Isaac? That was a literal promise from God. Does he actually see so many Jews that it's the sand in the sea? No, he does not. Think about Isaac. Does Isaac get to see that, that those kind of numbers from his own offspring? No, he does not. Jacob. Jacob is told that he'll have a promised land, right? He's told, I mean, he wrestled with God, guys. He's told that he'll have all these blessings, and yet when he dies... He's in the arms of Joseph. And where's Joseph? Joseph is in Egypt, isn't he? Joseph is in Egypt, so he's not even in the same land. And yet they all knew that God was working. They knew that they had received the promises and that more were to come down the line. But they did not get to see them. And so we have just these three individuals being mentioned. We see that they have positive impact on their faith. And we see that they lay hold of them, as you see on the screen, the Greek they claimed them. They lived a life that this is going to happen. They saw it. They perceived that God was working. They knew something was happening. They just couldn't see the big picture and how it was going to come in. But they knew something was coming. And they were assured. They were persuaded of the, the promises of God. They embraced them. They, they saluted. They bid them welcome. They respected and honored them. And you can see ultimately that they confessed <laughs> that they were strangers. Guys, they declared what? They gave thanks for the fact that they were, they were foreigners because ultimately they had their eyes set on the heavenly places. Their eyes weren't fixed on where they were. They were looking to the heavenly blessings. There's a lesson there for us, isn't there? You know, we're coming up on an election season. Don't lose focus on the big picture, Glad Baptist Church. Focus on the promises of God. Focus on the trusting of his character. We see that that leaves a legacy. And ultimately, we see that these guys, they realized they were pilgrims on earth. Guys, look at the word strangers there. It's so important. The word stranger means what? It means a foreigner, but it also it has nomadic roots. Guys, this is the lowest, other than a servant, this is the lowest place in society you can have. Because you had no homeland. Right? Most of us would say, I'm a citizen of America. And that means a lot when you go to other countries, doesn't it? Oh, America's big, right? They have money. And, and when we go to Africa, like, oh, Americans all have lots of money. I'm sure your daughter has, has encountered that too. And so there's this idea, I'm from America. But back then, when this is written, the Greek is referring to the idea that Abraham, even though he had a lot of wealth, does he have a homeland to call his own? He does not. In fact, he has a nomadic existence. Again, we tie that into the idea of dwelling in tents. He has no literal foundation. And so it's time to focus on the big picture. Verse 14, verse 14. Those who say such things, they declare plainly that they seek a homeland. You can see that they're, they're obvious, right? 
There's the idea that they're craving their own place, their own identity. And yet it will not happen. Why? Because they're foreigners here. That's not their, their long-term place. Very, very, very important stuff. Now, verse 15. I'm going to pause here, okay? Uh, before we, That's in the middle section. But before we get there, Bill, Bill Anthony told me today that when we were highlighting verses, that, that on a Kindle, you can do what, Bill? You can put multiple colors. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. I apologize. So I had you guys highlighted verses that are really, really important, right? And I passed out the highlighters. This is not a highlighter-worthy verse, but this is a you should highlight this in some kind of color or make a big note. Because it is a cultural, it is a huge verse for the book of Hebrews. And ultimately, we'll see it's a very big verse for us. It's just not highlighter worthy. Because remember, you can be going through anything in life, but a highlighter worthy verse, you read it and it can change you. This one, for the context of Hebrews, is very, very important and to the readers. Verse 15. Truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. You can see on the screen, if they had remembered that they were from some special homeland. Oh, hey, I'm from America. What would they be tempted to do? They'd be tempted to go back, wouldn't they? This is so important, guys. This is so important. They would be tempted. They'd have an opportunity. They'd, they'd have a fixed time where, man, you know, I could, I could turn back and go to a place I know instead of trusting in the character of God. Guys, so important, okay? So let's pay attention. First of all, the literal context, this is written to who? It's written to Jews who are literally being tempted to go back to the old law. This is a home run for our author. Don't do that. Don't do that. Trust Christ. Abraham didn't, and you shouldn't either. You have to move forward in Christ Jesus. So as a reader, culture for this book of Hebrews, the author saying, don't go back. You've got to focus on Christ. And then, if you think of us, how many times? Oh, man, we mentioned the good old days. And we think of, man, I remember when I lived back in the old, in my old house. Or, boy, I'm tempted to go back to Sacramento. I mean, my family's there, right? No, don't go back ever forward in Christ Jesus. So it touches us as well because many times, many times we're tempted, aren't we, to go back to doing things how we used to do things. But then we think of the literal, the literal examples, guys, and I put in the last bullet point. The last bullet point, Israel does not have the promised land. They're in slavery in Egypt for 450 to 500 years. They are not even out of captivity for a week. They get to the Red Sea, and what do they complain about? Man, Moses, if we, it'd been better if we'd have just stayed in slavery, making bricks all day, instead of dying here in front of this cool, you know, cool-looking lake. I mean, guys, Moses, the number one complaint constantly throughout, throughout the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, is what? Oh, man, it was never this bad in Egypt. Then what did they constantly want to do? They constantly wanted to go back and go back. And yet God has so many more better things for them. And yet they constantly wanted to try to go back. How about Jesus, New Testament? It pertains to us as well. Luke chapter 10 Three different individuals say to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you. Excuse me, Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus says what? Jesus says no one who puts his hand to the plow and does what? And looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Glad Baptist Church ever forward in Christ Jesus, never backwards. Amen. Never backwards. The fruit of the Spirit is patience, endurance, and continuing on. And then we see, how about the last one? Old Testament. Elijah. He's about to pass the baton on to who? Elisha, right? And what does Elisha, when he encounters his, his soon-to-be mentor, he goes out and does what? Guys, he goes out and burns his team of oxen, doesn't he? He goes out and says, all right, I'm going to burn everything. I'm going to offer the sacrifice, and then... I'm following Elijah because God's called me. I can't go back. And just for the record, Elisha was worth a lot of money for the, for the record because he had multiple teams of oxen. That means back in the day, he was quite well off. He had a lot of money. And he gave it all up. He burned it, saying, I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. And then one day as he's walking along, Elisha, what happens to Elijah? 
He swept up. He swept up. And Elijah keeps moving forward. You cannot go back. And so many times without faith, without trusting God's promises, without trusting in his character, what do we do? We forget and we want to go back, don't we? We want to go back to what we know, what we think, instead of what God has told us. Instead of many times a life that's uncertain, but God is leading us. So many times we are just like these characters here. But verse 16. But now they desire, since they don't go back, they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. As you guys can see, our last, our last P, many times it's preparation. I would agree, agree with that. But we see, to, to me, this is just my, my <laughs> interpretation. There's proof of faith, which carries into verses 17 and 18. But the proof of faith is ultimately in heaven, isn't it? It is. Now, of course, we also could look at proof is in the fruits of the Spirit, and we see someone's life. Someone that lives by faith, we see their life is different from everybody else because they trusted in God's character. And out of that, we see the fruits of the Spirit. But we see that these guys, they desired a better. Guys, they reached out. They were stretching themselves. Why? Because they wanted a more excellent home. Circle the word better. Circle the word better. We've had this multiple times. You guys can have a new covenant, a better more excellent covenant with God himself. Why? Because through the blood of Christ Jesus, you now have access to God's throne. The word better is quite important in the book of Hebrews, isn't it? Very, very crucial. In fact, I was going to put on your notes all the uses of better in the book of Hebrews. Unfortunately, it filled the page. All the references. So do you think God himself wants us to not only live a life of faith, but wants to give us more excellent blessings? The answer is, oh yeah, amen, yeah, hallelujah, yeah. He absolutely wants to give us more, but we actually have to have faith. We have to trust in his promises and his character, because without faith, it is impossible to please him. It's impossible to please him. Guys, you see that God is not, because of that moving forward, because of that faith, because they desired an even more excellent, more excellent blessings, God is not ashamed to what? To call them their God. Guys, he, he does not feel shame to invoke upon them, to place upon them a title that should be very special to all of us. And that is a child of God. Amen to that. Amen. Those who trust Christ Jesus and his blood on the cross, you are now no longer an alien. You're no longer foreign to God himself. You're a child of God. And that name oh, should bring you so much joy. It should give you such an identity that it surpasses whatever bad childhood you had. God loves you. He claimed you. He called you as his own. And that is because of your, the life of faith that you would like to live in him. Wow. We see that he has prepared a city for them. Not only can you be given, a, guys, the title, a child of God, but you will have what? A prepared city. And you see that it's been made ready for you. Jesus, in the night in which he's betrayed, he washes the disciples' feet. Judas leaves. And Peter is very discouraged because he's told by Jesus that he is going to betray, just as Judas does. He's going to betray Jesus. And right after that, John chapter 14, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. Guys, the proof of one's faith ultimately is seen in the heavenly blessings and seen in the literal heaven itself. And then we're going to see next week, it's in the actions of those who have lived a life of faith. Again, showing the fruits of the Spirit. But as we close, I want you to just look, hopefully you've written them down. I want you to look at the five, those five Ps. The pilgrims, the pilgrimage you're going to go on, the promises of God, His perspective, it needs to be heavenly. Look at all of those, at all of those title capital Ps. I am not exaggerating when I say as you look through the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, as you look through your life and reflect, I think I speak for all of us when I say you're going to realize that that's, you're probably in one of those right now, aren't you? Maybe I'm on a pilgrimage. I don't, I'm going to move to Colorado and I don't know what God's got for me other than my family's there, right? Maybe, maybe you need a new perspective on life because you've been looking down at your feet instead of looking up at where God is leading you. Maybe 
you need to have a better, a little bit better on the provision of God or his, his promise. Or maybe you need a little bit more power from him. But I think I speak for all of us by saying we're somewhere in one of those. And again, if you look at verses 23 through 29, you're going to see that Moses went through those exact same pillars of those of faith, those pillars of really the, the peace that we went through today. And I think as we close today and we summarize it all, you've heard me say that it is not a cliche. You need more Jesus, don't you? If you want to go through those, if you want to make the Hall of Fame, you need more Jesus. If you want to see the fruits of the Spirit and that patience drawn out of your life, you need more Jesus. You don't duct tape it on him. You get closer to God Almighty, don't you? Amen. And you can only do that through faith in his character and his promises because without faith, it's impossible to believe him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just an unbelievable passage. Lord, I haven't done it justice. There's just so much here for us to just completely just continue to suck on the meat. But Lord, I pray for our hearts right now that if we're not where we need to be, that Lord, we confess that. That we say, Lord, I want to live a life of faith. I don't know what that means, but I want to do it. I'm going to trust you with every decision for my finances, to my children, to my house. Everything revolves around faith in you, Father, that that would be our heart this morning. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, we would begin to earnestly, diligently seek after you because that is the one way in which we know we can please you. Father, we thank you for this time. What are we saying today? What's our life? Jesus, I love you. We're just doing verse one.